Good afternoon. So, just Wayne from Atos, company in French company, but I'm now working in Austin, uh, managing a relationship between Atos and, and IBM. And one of my tasks here is to look at neural networks uh, and art machine learning and artificial intelligence on the Power Platform. And one of the interesting projects which I have had the fortune to work on has been with the European Space Agency, who in, in 2013 launched uh, the Gaia satellite uh, into space on top of a Soyuz uh, rocket, and they put it into what they call the Lagrange, the second Lagrange point, which is one and a half million kilometers, so about a million miles from, from Earth, and uh, most interestingly, in the shadow of the, the moon and the sun. So the Lagrange, second Lagrange point, is a perfect balance between the centripetal force of the rotation of orbit around the sun and the gravity of the, of the gra gravity attraction of the, the Earth and the Moon itself. There are three Lagrange points in the around the, in our solar system. So the object of this uh, this is the satellite. Uh, it contains a, uh, a 900 million pixel camera. So this is not your granddad's digital camera. And it takes a picture of about uh, 2 million stars every hour. It's rotating around. And the, and the angular accuracy of the camera is uh, measured in micro arc seconds, which is 10 micro arc seconds. And that is equivalent of like the, the angle of a quarter would make on the moon seen from Earth. You know, it's really, really fine resolution camera. And uh, so this thing is rotating in space at Lagrange 2, and it's just sweeping its periodically across the sky, and precession means we sweep past different parts of the, of the sky uh, uh, every time it goes round. So this is a really cool project. There aren't that many projects that can say we've got a satellite a million miles from Earth to, to be working on. You know, I'm really happy to be working with these guys, working with scientists and astronomers. It's a fantastic project to be working with. And the, the objective is, is to bring the most accurate map of the, of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, uh, to date. The current state of the art is this. This was 1996. It's uh, about 100,000 stars with an accurate model and about an, an another 2 million uh, which, with, with much less precision about the, 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 what we've got in them. And so this is the current state. You know, the, the, we have, it's a huge difference. You know, we're going from uh, a couple of million to 1.7 billion. Wow. We, the, we, the, the data release 2 which was in April of last year, we announced, we had identified 1.7 billion stars uh, in, of the Milky Way, okay? This is just 1% of the stars in the Milky Way. All the rest are too faint. So if this we put in a book, this is book one, there'll be 99 other books <laughs> to, to get to the end of the, the to, to get all the stars in our galaxy. It's a, it's a huge, it's, it's numbers that we just have a hard time understanding. And this is a synthetic map of, uh, it's not actually a camera, you know, we don't get pictures out of this thing, it just measures the light, we just measure the light. So this is a synthetic image of uh, our galaxy. These are the small and the large Magellan clouds, which are two, uh, two, two near, not our nearest, but two of our near neighbors, which are about a tenth of the size of the, the Milky Way. So they're a long way away, and you're here. This is where... <laughs> <laughs> This is where the, roughly where the, the solar system, the solar, our, our solar sun is turning around in here. And the team I'm working with, in, with the, which is a team in Geneva, Switzerland, they specialize in what's called variable stars. And variable stars are very important because we use these to measure intergalactic distances, special, special distances, because the, the Cepheids, which are listed here, one particular type of star, we, they've given us, with a given mass, they, bright, they shine with a known brightness, so they become a standard candle. We can see if it's this bright, we know how heavy it is, we know how far away it is, and with that we can measure distances. So there are several types of, uh, of, of, uh, pulsate, of, of variable stars, ones which are intrinsic, which sort of in, they, they change size, and so we're talking here about uh, stars which are several tens or hundreds of times the mass of our own sun, which can double in size in the space of a few days. It's speeds which we just cannot imagine, what, you know, these th pulsating things. And then we have extrinsic ones, you know, you can imagine a, a, you know, a planet or some dust going in front of a star, it's going to change its brightness, or you have two, two stars, a pulsar, two stars rotating around each other, the, the, the light varies. So we see these variable stars and we, we get this sort of graph in, in the brightness of the stars. 
And there's a whole class of these things. This is just the variable ones. This is just the variable ones. The non-variable ones, uh, there, there's another tree. So the idea here is, is with 1.7 billion, we have to classify the stars into say whether it's a Cepheid or an RRL or, or, or a different type. And so we, this is the, the project. Yeah? They, they give us, we're going to try and identify uh, of all this, this 1.7 billion, the, the ones that are variable, we're going to try and classify them and, and say what sort of star they are. And maybe we'll find some stars of a new type. You know, this, is, this is the hope. So the data we get from the satellite uh, is we get about 150 attributes per star. And so we get the color, uh, its brightness, uh, its position, its speed, its radial and uh, uh, radial speed and its speed towards us, uh, the parallax, and then we get some other compound attributes, which is the red minus the blue, which is a very important data point in astronomy for identifying stars. Then we get some other data around the observation themselves, so like number of times we've seen this star, it, its name, which is just a number, and then we have some stats uh, based on some of these things, based on the mean, uh, the skewness, how, how twisted the, the, the shape of the data is. The kurtosis is the tail, how much tail there is on the data, signal to noise. And these things are all, you've got vari variations on a theme, we have them weighted and denoised. And, and, uh, so a little bit of repetition in, in our data. So it's the sort of thing, the data we get. You know, it's a huge Excel table. You know, it's 150 columns wide and several hundred thousand stars long. Yeah, so it's just a big table. I'm not allowed to show you the real data. This is all made-up data, so you can't. <laughs> the data, <laughs> the data is, is is still confidential. This is just made up. But this is the you know, it's just like that. That's exactly the sort of stuff we get. And what does the data look like? So I took the data straight out of the we got from from the, the ESA, and I plotted it out just uh, the, the, the variable stars we have here. So this is the RR Leo, the Cepheids, the things that look like our sun, eclipsing stars. And I just put the left-right ascension and the declination, and you just plot them out, and it gets this. And what do we have here? We have the large and the small Magellan clouds. You know, you can, so it looks like the data we've got is pretty healthy. Yeah, so it looks like we've you know, got some reasonable stuff in here. And if we plot some other stuff, this is more astronomical stuff, so we can see that uh, here we have the blue minus the red. BP is, is a blue photometry, red photometry, plotted, so plotted against the brightness. G is the brightness of the star. And we can see one of the things, interesting things about this data is, uh, these data, is that we're trying to find the lines that we can put in this graph. We could draw around saying this is a Cepheid, this is an RR Leary. This is the whole point of machine learning, is, is to identify where we can draw a line to say we think this is a, this type of star or that type, that type of star. And so this is for all the stars that are listed here. This is just for, um, uh, this is just for the RR Leary. Just different types, there are, four, there are four different types of RR Leary at least. And this is uh, the point to point slope, of the peak to peak slope of the, of the variation of the, that we see in the stars versus the, the brightness. And we can see some are flat, so we can't do anything with these. But the, all these stars here, you know, you say if, if the star is in this space on this graph, it is probably one of, one of a star of this type. And this is exactly the sort of thing we're trying to do with machine learning. We're trying to identify how, you know, what, what are the bits of the graphs, of all these different graphs we get, the 150 data points allow us to identify which star we've got. And um, sort of traditionally, this has been done using statistical methods. You know, the, the guys are programming the statistical methods, so logistic and logical regression and these, these sort of techniques, uh, uh, state vector, support vector machines, uh, nearest neighbor k-means, these sort of th techniques to do this. And we wanted to see if machine learning would add a little bit of uh, detail to, to what they're, they're working on. We needed to clean some of the data because there are a certain number of things that we don't uh, need. So the number of observations that we make of a star is purely coincidental where, the, where, the, where we park the satellite. It's not deterministic. Then obviously the name of the star it doesn't help. That's just us. So we, have to take, we take those out and a couple of others. Um, at the moment we can't handle no missing data. You know, this is something we're going to look at in the future. But we can't handle missing data. Machine learning algorithms don't work with missing data uh, generally. 
So we have to remove any, any rows that contain a missing value. Uh, we also have to make sure that some of the, all the values are numeric. Yeah. It just turns out that this data we get, some of the values are interpreted as strings and we have to turn them into that. And then the other most important point is that we normalize. Machine learning routines that we use using neural networks uh, don't behave very nicely if the magnitude of the values is massively different. So we try and bring all the values into the same scale. So we redimension every single one of the columns into, let's say, between naught, everything is value between 0 and 100 or minus 100 and plus 100. We just rescale everything because we're, we're working from one millionth to a million uh, in terms of the, the numbers we're working with. And in order for the neural network to work, we need to do this operation. And these are typical. These are typical sorts of things you have to do with any machine learning project. And this was the interesting part of the project. You know, it's one thing to go in and get the book and copy the examples and do the thing, and it works. When you put your hands dirty on a project like this, you learn a whole bunch of stuff that don't cover in the book. And so the idea is, you know, will it work? You know, we're going to kick the tires, and, and you know, nobody had ever tried this. There's very little work that's been done in this space until now. Google had done some work about detecting exoplanets, and they'd published a paper on, on this. But there was really nobody doing this sort of work uh, when we started. And so we, we had no idea whether we were going to have something that worked or not. So the idea was that we, uh, we're going to give it a go. So the idea, just a quick recap on neural networks. The way this works is we give it a, this uh, supervised learning. We give it a, a data set we know the answers to. We, uh, so we say this, is, this, this data represents a Cepheid, this data represents a, an RR Leary, that sort of thing. And we put it in here. The, the neural network changes its weights and its biases all on its own using this mechanism here. And we see, you know, is, is the network predicting what it should be predicting, okay? And then we get this thing in the, the, the mo this network in the middle, which is traditionally called a model. And this becomes our application. Yeah, so we, this is our, you know, the point isn't to train. The point is to have the network and the model and the application building. And we give it the new data, and it's going to predict, with gives a certain degree of probability that this is a, a Cepheid or a or cat or a dog or a cancerous or not cancerous. It's, exa you know, it's exactly that sort of, uh, th those sorts of things we're trying to do here. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. And so basically the, the approach we took is you, you load the data, which was a CSV, you know, monstrous Excel table, which is a CSV format, into a, what's called a pandas data frame, which I'll mention in a minute. And then we delete the, all those columns we don't need. You know, the, one, the, the number of observations, the name. We normalize the values to between minus 100 and 100. Uh, then we take a very important step. We take a, uh, a sample of, uh, let's say, 20% of the stars or 15%. But 15% of every class, we, you know, if you take some classes, there are very few examples of. And if you don't just take 15%, then in your test data, it could be that you don't get any, exam any, any examples of those. So we, we're very careful about the type of sampling we make. And then uh, we're going to build a simple network and see if it works, you know, see, 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 what, see what happens. Um, all of this we used on uh, AC922 using Power AI, which is now called Watson Machine Learning Accelerator. A very Power AI, I thought it was a great name. It's a, it's a real shame we changed. And it comes with these uh, libraries. Pandas is the tool that we use to read uh, Excel ch XLS files, uh, CSV files, those sort of things, and it produces a a table in, in memory, a Python mem uh, table. NumPy is num numerical routines for matrix multiplication and that sort of thing. Uh, Keras is a framework which sits above TensorFlow, which allows us to very simply build a neural network. And I'll show you a little bit of code to show you how that works. And Scikit-Learn provides some other tools and numerical methods which uh, we, we rely on too. All, and what's really nice about this though, is once you have AI, Power AI installed, it, it's all there and it just works. It is, I think, uh, you know, I think IBM has done a really great job of, of packing this stuff up. It, everybody I've shown this to as a product, always the first comment that they make is easy to use. Yeah, I mean it's fast, but above all, it's easy to use. Everybody's that's compare. I'm not going to list the competitors, but everybody knows who the competitors are. 
The big differentiator of this platform is it's really simple to use. And, and, and this stuff is hard, you know, this stuff is complicated, and having, this, having it installed like this is, is a real, real uh, plus. So this is a, the code, and this is, you know, this is really how simple it is. I just wanted to show how simple making, making a neural network is with these libraries. So the first two lines, I read the features, that's the 150 attributes, and then I have the labels, is it as RR Leary, Cepheid, the type of the class of star, and I, label, I load those into two Panda data frames, and it's just a simple call. That's as simple as that, read the CSV, and that's it. I missed this thing, it's just one line, but I didn't want to really go into it. And then here's where I, I split, I save 20% off to make sure that my model I test my model. You know, I train it with 80% of the data, and then the 20% I test and see if it really works with data the model has never seen. And this is where I just do a train test split, and we see the test size here is 20%. And I, I initialize the random state. This is important if anybody wants to try and follow along. Is uh, if you don't initialize the, the random state when you're doing the split, then uh, it means every time you run it, you're going to get a different sample. And if your network behaves better at one time, you don't know it's because your data's changed or because your actual network is better. You know? So it's very important that when you're doing this stuff that your, your um, train test split prints, presents you with the same data when you're doing a test. You can't have all the, everything moving underneath you. Yeah. It's got to be constant. Here's the scaling, you know, three lines. Three lines of code, you, you know, you think it's going to be tough? It's really straightforward to do this stuff, you know? It's not hard. Unfortunately, much of this stuff is written by mathematicians, and for us, you know, IT guys, it's a bit hard to get our head around. You know, it's talking about partial differential equations and things we used to do at school, and you know, we can no longer remember what this is about. <laughs> and once you, but once you get to the to the real core of the stuff, it's it's not that hard. You know, it's not that hard. So this is essentially the code. The whole program, for my test program was probably less than 50 lines of code. It, it's, and plus the imports for the libraries, but it's, it's not very much. And then here's, here we how we build the, the model. So this, this is Keras. We create the, the model. We say it's a sequential model. It just means I'm putting one layer after the next. I create uh, one dense. And this first time, it's going to create an input layer and a, a hidden layer, which I'll talk to in a minute, a, another hidden layer, and an output layer. And I, these are just the magical incantations you've got to put on the code. Uh, and then we just compile it. So now I have a network, yeah, a network ready to train. And that's just really four lines of code. And this has given me this, uh, this, this is the basic architecture of my model. This is 150 attributes uh, going into my model in the input layer. I have two hidden layers, and then I have my four star classes that I was testing at the time. So Cepheid, RR, Leary, Sunlike, whatever it was. They're the classes that come out at the end. And that's the basic architecture of my model. And so once I have that, I'm going to train it. So I give it the, 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 the pandas array that I was created earlier, you know, the, with, all the, with all my attributes. I give it the answers, which is the, you know, the, the, the classes for that. And it just goes away 4,000 times. And it puts all the weights up. And it spits out a model at the end. And this is really fast on a power system. This is, you know, this, I'll talk to this at the end, but this, this makes a huge difference. This is fast. This is, you know, a minute. You know, it's, it's really quick. It gives us the uh, model. We can evaluate to say, how did you do? You know, and, and that's it. That's it. And piece of code, and we came out. First go. The first go. Two, two, <laughs> two hidden layers. 80% accuracy. Now, accuracy is a, is a measure of, uh, of, of how the models behave. There are several types of measurement of how well your model is behaving. So it's the true positives and the true negatives over the total of the, of the things we're estimating. And this is it within you know, a few percent of the best results that the guys in, in, in Geneva were getting with their linear, linear models, you know, the logistic models. So we, we're onto a winner. You know, I think we're really onto a winner with this. We, you know, first go we, so we think let's let's make a little more effort and, and see what happens. So how do we refine it? The first problem we encountered was we think oh we just let the model run a bit more, and we ran into this problem of overfitting. So here we have a few data points. Uh, which I think most of us can see is a pretty straight line. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the line we want. Yeah, that's the equation of the line. On top, it's 
one type of star underneath it's another type of star. When you run your model too much, you get this. It tries to minimize the error, and it'll put the line through all the points, and you get something funky like this. And what you see is that the, the accuracy for your training data gets great, and then all of a sudden, for your test data, it starts to diverge, it starts getting worse, and that's a, a sign of overfitting. And there's one really easy technique. I don't understand how it works. It's a complete mystery, and that is you put in a layer that just throws 50% away. 50% of the results, you just throw them away, or 20% or 80%. And uh, it, for some magical reason, I don't, I don't understand the maths, uh, but it works, and it stops the overfitting. There are other techniques, but this one's an easy one. And so we have all these parameters. We have all these parameters in, our, in the network. Uh, you know, what's the shape? How many hidden layers do I need? How, how wide should my, my layers each be, you know? Uh, which is the activation function? At the end of every, at the output of every neuron, we try and limit the value slightly of, of that comes out. We can either limit it between zero and one, or minus one and one, or we, we try to, it keeps the network stable. So we have a, this activation function at the out, out of each neuron, which, which we can modulate. There's this learning rate. We try and minimize, as, as we're trying to get to the best solution, we take a step forwards down, down the slope to minimize the error. And this step can be a big step, uh, where we buy a risk of going past the, the, the optimal, or a small step, and it takes ages to get there. There are certain, you know, I talked about accuracy, precision, the, the different ways of measuring the success of the network, which optimizer we use, you know, do, we, do I put one star in the time, do I put all my stars in the time, and then, then do my network. There's a whole bunch of different things we can tune the network during the training phase. So here I have seven, you know, there's seven things here. You know, we can, and these are just ordinary buttons. You, you, everybody has to decide what they're going to put in these things. So if we've got seven things we can change, and if you just give maybe 10 values for each one of those, that's 10 million. 10 million combinations you have to test. It's, ju it's just huge. The number of things you have to do, you know, it is, a <laughs> you know, we're not really an efficient industry. You know, we waste a lot of time and a lot of time sitting idle and doing things, but machine learning takes the cake here. You know, we, it's really, really inefficient way of doing things, but it's the way things are done. So in order to find the best network that I want, even ignoring, you know, I decide that my, my network's going to be five deep and, and 150 wide, but even for one architecture, I still have 10 million things to test, you know, with just 10. And if I had 20, obviously getting way, way worse. And uh, so this is why having a fast machine makes all the difference. If you can get your batch to run in five seconds or 10 seconds, you know, you can run 10 million. You know, you go, you leave it for the weekend and come back and <laughs> you're okay. If, you, if it takes two hours, yeah, it's, it's a non-starter. Yeah, so uh, this is why fast really is important in this, in this world and having the accelerators is a really, really big deal. And, the, the four GPUs you get in the, in the AC922 is a really great, it's a fantastic box. It really is a fantastic box to work with. So how do we do this? You know, it takes a, you know, even, even with a fast box doing 10 million and then for every network architecture, it takes a while. And so um, scikit-learn provides us some tools which to, to, to automate. You know, you don't want to change it by hand and uh, and then run it and then come back again two minutes later and change something. There's some tools to automate these, this thing. And uh, the first one we use is a randomized search. So we just give it the list of the variables we want and it's going to choose a certain number of them. And uh, the second one is a systematic search with a grid search, which will do all the 10 million. So our approach was to, to wrap the model that I produced initially so that scikit-learn can use this and be completely automated. We did a random search initially, the best, the best two results we got on the random search, we did a grid search locally around those two low points and we chose the, the, the network which was optimized for that. And it's really quite simple to do this stuff. You know, you're passing uh, a dictionary, uh, so it's a key value thing, and the key is the name of the, the parameter we want to modify, and the, di and the, and the value of that against that key is the, is the list of values we want to test. So it could be, uh, uh, the, you know, the learning rate. We could say the learning rate. The key is learning rate, and the value is the list from uh, 0 0.001 to, to, to 0 0.01. Uh, that's, and that's the sort of thing you just pass in. You just pass it in, and you go home 
in the evening, you come back the next day and see what, it's, see what it says. And uh, it, so we used the random search to quickly find a minima, and then we did a grid search around, around the minima. And uh, we got some starting to get some great results. But before that, I'll just talk a little bit about the, some of the other optimization we made first. So as I said, we get a lot of statistics about statistics. So we had this thing about kurtosis, which is the, the amount of tail in, in a number of the attributes. And they, you know, we had them standardized, we had them biased and weighted and unweighted. These were all essentially the same value, just shifted a little bit left or right or scaled a bit left or right. So there was, ex there was very high correlation between a certain number of the columns that we have uh, in, in the data. And there was this for skewness, and there was this for, for the means, and the, you know, there are loads of this stuff. So uh, what we can do, the scikit-learn tool set and the, allows us to identify columns that are correlated. And we can say anything that's correlated higher than 95%, we just keep one of them, and the rest we throw away. And this is important because all of this stuff is matrix multiplication. And matrix multiplication is uh, O n cubed. Yeah, it's, you double the size of the matrix, the time of execution it goes up by eight. Yeah, it's, it's, it, so keeping the matrix size down, it helps enormously in this space. I mean, we have 150 parameters. People who are doing images, they're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of, of, of attributes for the image. So we're already not very big, but this really does make a difference if you want to loop through a big search. Uh, so the next step we made was uh, remove the correlated features, and then there's a second technique which uh, Scikit-Learn provides, which is primary component analysis PCA. I won't go into the details, but essentially it will um, merge a large number of columns into a smaller number of columns, keeping the same variance. Okay, it's, it's mathematics. I, frankly, I don't understand, but it it works. It works reasonably well. So, it's, and it's just one call again. If you're using PCA, it's really straightforward to use in the in the in the, in the Python code. And this was what we got. We got an accuracy of 94% out of this out of this box. And this is what we call a confusion matrix, based on the percentages. So the idea this this is what we predicted. This is what it is. This was so. This was a sphi sphixi. This is a cephid. This is a mirror. This is our alir. This is the level one of the classes. And, uh, this, and these are all in percentages. So the idea is this is what the true was, and this is what we predicted. So the idea is that we get 100 down this, this axis here, and zero everywhere else. So you can see sort of how the model is behaving. Uh, and this is against the test data. This is not against the training data. This is against our test data. And you can see we've got, a, you know, we've got some improvements to make here. We can maybe refine the model a little bit further on. But you know, here we're doing really, really great. You know? <laughs> and, uh, this is, this is at least as good as the traditional methods uh, have shown to, to be capable of. So it's a, a very, very promising start. Uh, the other, as I said, we, oh, the, the time we, execution d diminishes with, uh, depending on the technique we use. So this is removing the correlated columns. This is where the best result. We got 94%. Uh, and we got a 15% reduction in time. The PCA, uh, we got a much worse result, but it's, it's saved time. So we, we abandoned the PCA approach, and uh, we, we now concentrate on, the, on, on testing. You know, do, we, do we use 95% correlation, 99% correlation? It, all of this stuff is black magic. You know, there's no real science behind it. It's, it's all guesstimates and just intuition. So we got a great result. You know, and we, we're starting to talk to, to Geneva again about, about the results and what we can do next. And uh, this is the things that, these are things that are coming up. We used uh, 150 attributes. The satellite also measures uh, the, the, with a, with a going from measuring from red to blue, uh, 60 color bands. And how these color bands change over time. So rather than just being, we just got data. You know, this, it's here, it's going this fast, it's this bright. And that just happened to be the time it measured it. You know, we just got here. We've got things. Uh, we get we get a, a graph of the shape of how things are changing over time, as measured by the satellite. And so we can do. You know, you can imagine we look at the shape of the curve and say th this shape is characteristic of a Cepheid or it's characteristic of an RR Leary. And so we're going to try and uh, use um, recurrent neural networks, which is a technique which is used. Uh, everybody uses it. It's the technique you use on your t on your telephone for text prediction. You know, when, when you look at what's gone in the past, you can guess what's going to happen in the future. 
there aren't that many applications, so it's used for prediction. There aren't that many applications that use it for classification. So we're, again, we, we, I haven't found much evidence, you know, there isn't much science that I've, which I'm familiar using this for, for classification the way we're going to use it. So maybe it won't work, yeah, but this is our current strategy to, to look at it. You know, if the worst comes to the worst, we just print the graph and give it to an image recognition thing and say, <laughs> is it in our area or not? And then we have to deal with the missing data. So there are loads of techniques here. We could just uh, take an average, uh, or we can, you know, there are some things we can do with, with dealing with missing data. But then we need real help from the scientists. You know, that we can't, I'm an I'm a IT guy, I can't tell you what number has to go in the hole. So uh, we're going to need some help with that. So this is the work we're going to do. And I'm quite confident that, you know, we're going to get, we're going to really improve on this 95%. Uh, the takeaways for this was that, uh, as I said, having a fast and fast server and it makes a huge difference. It's not just fast; it is fast on the way it runs, but also fast in in the way we use it. You know, it's not hard to, to write this program. Once you've got Power AI installed, it is really straightforward to use. And, and anybody who's a little bit familiar with Python and the, and the numerical libraries can can make a use of it. Uh, that's what's in the second line. We have DDL, so this distributed deep, deep learning is available off the shelf across the four GPUs, so we can spread the, the, the learning process across four GPUs to further accelerate. I haven't actually tried this. This is another piece of future work we have to do. Um, as you saw, the code is really straightforward to build a neural network. It, it's not that hard with Keras. Keras is a really fantastic library, especially compared to TensorFlow. TensorFlow, which is the underlying library, is much more an assembler style uh, build it your own network thing. Uh, Kiras is relatively straightforward, and uh, you know the really big takeaway is that you know we've got a great result. Neural networks are a fantastic approach to doing this work, and I would really um, like to talk to uh, ESA to talk about doing it with the, the other stars because I think we've got you know we have the variable stars which represent a certain percentage of the population, but the, the bulk of the population of the stars are non-variable, so I think we can probably uh, do something there too. So that's uh, what we're looking forward to. So if there are any questions... So when you went back to Geneva, what was their feedback? They are extremely, you know, they're, they're very enthusiastic about it. They've tried a little bit with, um, I don't know if people are familiar with the H2O framework, which is a Java framework. They've tried a little bit of this, mostly numerical routines rather than machine learning, uh, but they were very pleased with, the, the, with our initial results. Yeah? They we're getting a little bit of traction inside ESA, even at, you know, we work on the, uh, just on the Gaia project, which is this satellite, uh, but even with ESA as globally, there's a little bit of uh, awareness about what the work that we've done here and uh, some interest. So, you know, I, I'm a little bit, I'm hopeful, you know, we, nobody's signed on the dotted line just yet, but I'm hopeful that we can, we're can showing some promising results, and uh, they're, they're a great team, you know, working with these scientists, you know, it takes us out of our normal job, you know, I'm usually working, I guess, like lots of people with, with insurance companies and, and, you know, and banks and government buildings, and going to see these guys, it, you know, it's a breath of fresh air, it's fantastic working with these guys, always very open, keen to, you know, always push in, it's been fantastic, but... And they're very enthusiastic about our initial results, yeah, and they're going to provide us with more data. Unfortunately, the data we have is, is not yet released, so that's why I can't show you the, the, the real numbers, but the, you don't think you need to, to, to see it to understand what we've done. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're in fairly good shape here, I think. For How much time of data did you use to build your network? So, was that so the, 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 so the, the very first, the very first thing, no, yeah, there's nothing. The first, the first set of stars we got, we had 6,000 stars, which is, of which, you know, we had missing data from, from about 500, and then I kept 20%, so that was another 1,000. So we trained on about 5,000 stars, 4,500 stars. And uh, the latest group of data we're going to get is going to be in the order of 300,000 stars. So it's, it's not, you know, we're a long way from 1.7 billion. Yeah, but... I'm confident that when, when the, the rest of the data come, we're going to be in. We can, we're going to absorb it, yes. I know, yes, sure, sorry. No, no, please. Um, I may have missed uh, information to share about this project. Uh, would you please share uh, what's the purpose of uh, our project? And uh, what do you think the 
Okay, so, okay, so uh, the European Space Agency sent a satellite, Gaia, uh, uh, into space in 2013 to create a, a, a map of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's the most accurate map we've got of, the, uh, of our galaxy. And uh, in the last data release, they, they identified uh, 1.7 billion light sources. And that includes some of the things that are floating around the sun, the asteroids and things like that. And it's not just stars, but it is mostly stars. And uh, we have to, you know, you have to, what the idea is that the space agent is not just an idea of saying, here's a star. You have to say, this star is a star of, you know, it's a binary star, it's a pulsar, or it's uh, one of these well-known ones which are called Cepheid. Uh, stars. We have to classify it in the same way as uh, you would classify animals, you know, between reptiles and, and reptiles and mammals, and you know, and then underneath them, the mammals we have, you know, I, can, I don't know what's underneath mammals, but you know, there's men and dog and cats and, and cows, you know. The, we, we classify the stars in the same sort of hierarchy uh, as we classify animals and plants and just about everything else in the world. Yeah, so, our idea here is to build a neural network which will take the raw data from the satellite and uh, say this star is a Cepheid or an RR Leary with a confidence of 80% or 90%. And that's the, the goal of the project. Okay, and if there's any questions afterwards, I'm happy to take them.